Have you ever met identical twins? You know, growing up, there were, I remember two girls who were cousins on my, they were my grandmother's sister's children. And they were twins. Two girls. They were identical in every way. They looked the same. They sounded the same. They often dressed the same. And while we did not see them very often, when we did, it was difficult to tell them apart. However, there was one difference between them. One of them, and I can't remember which one, had an eye defect. One of her eyes was slanted a little bit on one side. And that was the only way I could tell the difference between the two. It was something of a birthmark that, was able, that I was able to identify her with. Now, did you know also that all true believers possess certain marks that set them apart from the rest of the world? We could rightly call these our birthmarks. And they appear when we are saved. And they mark us as children of God. Every born again believer has these birthmarks. And some people doubt whether it is possible for us to know if you are saved or not. But the Bible tells us we can know. Amen? Amen? The Bible tells us that we can know if we are saved or not. Job knew. He said, I know my Redeemer liveth. You see, only the redeemed could claim the Redeemer. Hallelujah. Paul knew. He said, for I know whom I believed in. I am not ashamed. And if God is no respecter of persons, if Job knew and Paul knew, then you and I can know too, right? Hallelujah. We can know. In fact, one of the reasons why the Apostle John wrote his first epistle was to help people to know for sure that they are indeed saved. And as you read 1 John, it becomes clear that he is trying to help people understand their absolute salvation. And in this small book of five chapters, John uses the word know, K-N-O-W, 39 times. He's trying to tell us that there are some things we can know. And one of them is that whether or not we are saved. Now you're probably wondering, but bro, Mickey, what kind of message is this? You see, recently, when we called for altar prayer, a brother came up. And thank God, he's not here today, so he wouldn't feel funny in any way. But I asked him, I said, brother, what can we pray for you? And he said, his answer surprised me a bit. He says, I have doubts. Pray that my doubts, I will overcome my doubts. Now maybe you do not have doubts, but there are others who do. And if you have struggled in this area, I want to help you get this matter settled today once and for all. I want to share with you the birthmarks of a true believer. Birthmarks of a true believer. You see, identifying the presence or the lack of these traits in our lives will help us understand where we stand with God. We do not have to struggle with this. God can give us assurance one way or the other. And our main text is coming out of 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 to 13. But I will be touching on other verses in 1 John. So I want you to please follow along with me as we read. 1 John chapter, chapter 5. The very first verse there reads, Whosoever believe it that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot it, loveth him also that is begotten of him. This verse tells us that the true believer is one who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Now everybody does that, doesn't it? Anybody, ask anybody. You believe Jesus is the Christ? Of course. They will tell you yes. 
But belief is not just mental acknowledgement of the facts. Instead, it is knowing something with the head, but is also accepting the truth in your heart. Amen. Amen. It's not just head knowledge, it is heart knowledge. And genuine belief or what we may call saving faith is coming to that place where you are trusting nothing and no one but Jesus Christ for your salvation. There is no room for works. There is no room for good deeds. There is no room for religion. There is nothing, there is no room for anything in your heart but an understanding of who Jesus is and accepting that yes indeed he is my Lord not just here, but here. Now, I cannot tell you whether or not you are saved. Only you know what you are trusting Jesus for. But we do have the promises of the word, don't we? In fact, in 1 John 5, 12, he says, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. John is writing so that we may know. Now you may say, well, I know I am saved. Well, why is John writing these things? Because there are people in the church who don't know where they are. John, in his gospel, 524, Jesus himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into them condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Jesus himself is telling us. Romans 10, 9, If thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And there are hundreds of more scriptures. John 3, 16, Acts 2, 21, Acts 16, 31, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And so much more. And the list could go on and on. We have also this principle from the, from the scripture. That God is holy and cannot lie. So what he promises to do, he will do. Therefore, he, if, he had, if you have trusted Jesus Christ for your Savior, according to the plan laid out in the Bible, then you are saved. You have God's word on that. So this brings us now to our first spiritual birthmark. A spiritual conversion. I'm going to give you four spiritual birthmarks. The first one be asked and answered. Was there a definite clear moment in your life when you trusted Jesus and nothing else to save your soul? Is that a good enough question? You see, as it is written in the word of God, there is none righteous, no, none one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Did you ever see yourself as lost and came to the place where you recognized and acknowledged your sins to God? You see, until you can see your sins and see yourself as a savior, you cannot be saved. This is the process of conviction. And it is the Holy Spirit drawing men and women to himself. Did you recognize anywhere the horrible consequences of your sin? That because of your sin, according to the word of God in Isaiah, you have been separated from your God. Now I know I'm talking to Christians and I'm talking to saved people, but I'm trying to get you to the point where you know where you are in the Lord. Did you understand that you were dead in your sins according to Ephesians? And that because of your sins you were headed to an eternity in hell? Did you ever come to that place where you understood completely what Jesus did for you when he died on the cross? And when he rose from the dead? Did you understand that when he died, he was dying for your sins? Shedding his blood for your sins? Did you understand that when he arose from the dead, he did so to so provide you with a new life? Did you go beyond just knowing these things in your head, but you believed them in your heart? 
Did you cry out to God confessing yourself a sinner, acknowledging Jesus Christ and his shed blood as your only hope for salvation? Did you trust him and nothing more to save your soul? And when you experienced this, was it a crystal clear thing in your mind? I mean, when you look back now, is there a clearly defined moment in time when everything for you changed? See, this is what I'm talking about. There should be a spiritual conversion. Every one of us should have that in our lives. Amen? Amen? Oh, it's just that whole thing fuzzy and you can't even remember. How many of you can remember that special time, that moment in your life when you asked Jesus to come into your heart? You see, the, 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 the circumstances surrounding your conversion may differ. But one thing remains the same. There is going to be a specific time that every redeemed person can point to and say, right there, that's the time. That's the moment when Jesus came into my life and I was transformed. The demon possessed man in the tombs. He knew when he got saved. Saul on the road to Tarsus. He knew when he was saved. The woman at the well, she knew when she got saved. I know when I got saved. Hallelujah. August 1985. I am lying on a hospital bed. Four inch scar on my head. My darling wife. I didn't know how I ended up in the hospital. How I ended up in the emergency room. And the doctors are there trying to, st I'm covered in blood. My wife would tell me the story later. A vagrant walking on the street took a whack at my head with a metal. But I'm lying on the, on the bed there. And the doctors are telling me, you were lucky to be alive. But you will never be the same again. Because you will always have for the rest of your life, you will be suffering with epileptic episodes of fits. And I'm lying on the bed there with these words of the doctors in my head. Nowhere to go, nothing to do but to look up at the ceiling and I called unto the Lord. And I said, Lord, if you would bring me out of this, I will be yours forever. Come into my life. Take over. And I believe that's the day that the Lord did come into my life. And thank God that was 40 years ago. And by the grace of God, I have never had an epileptic surge. Never have I had an episode of fits in my life. Yes, the doctors were right. I would be different. But you see, it always usually takes a crisis to bring us there, doesn't it? And Paul remembered his crisis. He was blinded for three days. The demon-possessed man remembered his. The word of God tells us that he went back. Jesus says, go back and tell what the good things the Lord have done for you. And he went, it back and start, he went back and started a ministry. I believe every time he made his confession, he showed them the scars in his hands and in his body because he said, the word of God says that he would cut himself. Those were his testimonies. I still have that mark. That is my testimony. And I dread the day when I will become like Dominic and have no hair in my head because that scar will be visible. Yes, when I become totally bald, my head, that scar will become invisible. But you know what? Maybe I can use it as testimony. I could point to it and tell people, that was the day of my conversion. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, we will have, we will all have a time of confession, a conversion. And if you cannot remember, you see, there are people who grew up in the church. They've been coming with their parents. They have never had a conversion experience. And they think they are saved. Hallelujah. 
And Jesus, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, a most upstanding man in the community would come to Jesus and Jesus would say, you must be born again. And he made it clear, and you see, not everybody who comes to church is saved. And Jesus made it clear in, in, in Matthew 7, 14. He says, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. You see, there are people who come to church. They have never had that conversion experience. They think they are saved. But they are not. See, the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. But it has to be accepted. You have to invite God to come into your life. God doesn't rush in and barge in and say, here, take salvation. No, you have to ask the Holy Spirit to come. You have to ask the Lord. And at the point of asking, you have to confess your sins and tell him, I as I understand I'm a sinner, Lord. I want to be saved. And if you haven't done that, you need a checkup. Hallelujah. So you, there was going to be a spiritual conversion in every believer's life. There will also be a spiritual change. In 1 John 6, 7, we read, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. Do not tell the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ is done, cleanses us from all sin. This verse tells us that we who are saved will have a desire to walk with Jesus. Jesus is the light. And those who are saved will want to seek fellowship with Jesus. In other words, conversion will bring change. This is the theme that runs throughout this first epistle of John. He tells us that another birthmark of the true believer is going to be spiritual change in their lives. There will be a desire to have fellowship with the things of light. And the person who is truly saved by grace will gravitate naturally. You will gravitate towards the things of God. Hallelujah. Things like reading your Bible. Things like prayer. Things like worship. Things like fellowship with the saints. Things like coming to church as often as you can. Why? Because you love the Lord and you love his people. Praise the Lord. These things will be precious and special to you. Because you have been saved. And if you find that you are drawn to things of darkness, other than these things, then you might need to check where you stand with the Lord. There will be a desire within every true believer to do the things that God commands them to do and to avoid the things that God says we should not be doing. I'm speaking about change. Spiritual change. Genuine salvation is proven in our lives by our desire to follow God and to follow Jesus Christ. He that saith he abideth in him ought also himself to walk even as he walked. According to this verse, the genuinely saved person will want to walk just like Jesus. Everyone that doing righteousness is born of him. There will be such a change in the, be life, the believer's life that they will naturally begin to do the things that mark them as righteous. Am I speaking to anyone here? They will begin to live out their new life that was placed within them when they were saved by the grace of God. Whoever abided in him sinneth not. He that committed sin is of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born. This is God's word. Verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. The true believer cannot continue to live a life of sin. <laughs> Hallelujah. And according to these verses, the genuinely converted person will be unable, unable I say, to live a life of unrepented sin. 
And when John tells us that those who are saved do not sin, he is not teaching sinless perfection. We know that everybody sin, even Christians. But when the genuinely converted person sins, there is going to be an immediate sense of wrong. Hallelujah. And the true believer senses that he has broken his relationship with the Lord. And he runs quickly to try and mend it. Because the only way for a believer to handle sin is to, for them to confess it and bring it out in the open so that God can deal with it. Hallelujah. And those believers who do sin and are miserable, I tell you, you will be miserable. You will be miserable until you repent. And they are brought under the chastisement of God. The whole point is this. If you can live in sin and not be bothered about it, something is wrong. Amen? You are probably not saved. If you can sin and not suffer the chastisement, then you are probably not saved. Because why? Because God says he will deal with every child of his. He will bring you to chastisement. He will deal with you. Amen? If you can sin and enjoy it, something is wrong. If you can sin and live and live in sin every day of your life and not feel that ache in your heart for restored fellowship with God, then something is wrong. And I would suggest you need to fix that. Now don't mis misunderstand me. Save people do sin. But when they do sin, they do not enjoy it. Not like they did when they were not saved. And when they do sin, they will never get away with it. Why? For God will deal with them in love. And if they do not repent, he will deal with them in justice. He that knoweth God, heareth us. Here is another clear mark of genuine conversion. Is that the saved person will receive the word of God when it is preached and when it is read. It will not be something to doubt and debate and get angry over. The saved person will hear the voice of the Lord through his word and they will respond to it accordingly. Jesus said this would be one of the characteristics of a sheep. They will hear my voice. And the desire for the word of God, the ability to understand the word of God and the desire to do what God says in his word are all indicators of spiritual life. The true believer doesn't get upset. Doesn't get upset when the preacher, when he hears the preacher preaching about the need for purity and holiness and living holy. So don't get upset with me, right? You see, because when Jesus saves you, he literally changes you from the inside out. You become a brand new creature. And you can never be the same. In fact, you will not want to be the same. Yeah? My brother quoted this, uh, the, the scripture this morning. Colossians 3, 1. If then ye be risen with Christ, think on those things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. Set your affections on the things above and not the things on earth. If be quiet. Because you are dead, says the scripture. You are dead and your life is hit with God in Christ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So there is going to be a definite spiritual conversion and a definite spiritual change in your life. There will also be a spiritual love for the brethren. Here John 2.9 he that saith he is in a light and hear it, is, hate it, his brother is in darkness even until now. It is going to be a love that is unexplainable. It will be a love that is at times stronger than that for your own family members. Because you should never forget that you have more in common with, 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 with a Chinese believer or an African sister. Or somebody in, 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 in the islands. Why? Because they are children of God just like you are. The blood of Christ is flowing in their hearts and just as it is in yours. Hallelujah. And sometimes they meet more to us than our loved ones who aren't saved. 
So there will be a love for a spiritual love for other people, for other brethren. And this is a concept that is mentioned many times in this little book and elsewhere in God's word. John says if you are saved, this special spiritual manifestation of the love of God for others will be evident. There will be a desire to fellowship and worship with other believers. There will be concern over the welfare of others in the family of God. There will be concern when you, are, when you have offended some other believers in Christ. There will be a desire for reconciliation when there is a breach in the body of Christ. This and this, I can go on and on. There is more to this, but the point is clear, isn't it? Hallelujah. If we are genuinely saved, there will be an unexplainable desire to be with and to love our fellow brethren. So where do we stand so far? Spiritual conversion, spiritual change, spiritual love for others. All of these are easy to understand because we can see evidence of them in our lives. But the last one I want to share with you is a little bit more. It's less easily discerned. In 1 John 4.13 he says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he had given us of his spirit. There will be a spiritual companion in your life. I am referring to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. I am referring to that manner of inner peace in us. When the Holy Spirit has been, when you have been genuinely saved, there is going to be an inner witness of the Holy Spirit. He's, he moved into your life the day you got converted and you got saved. He moved into your life and he took up residence there. And his job is to seal us, to lead us, and to give us assurance of our salvation. And the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is proof positive that we belong to God. Amen. That is our seal. And this is a mysterious thing, but it is absolutely essential for the assurance of our salvation. Because you see, when the Spirit of God is present in your life, he will speak to your heart. He will tell you things. He will guide you, he'll warn you, he'll lead you, he'll feed you, he'll comfort you. He will convict you, he will tell you the truth. And he will rise up within your heart and confirm the reality of the adoption that you have in the family of God. And like a mother who grabs hold of that child every day, that insecure child and loves him and tells him how much she loves you, that's what the Holy Spirit does for every believer. Hallelujah. He is there to love you. He is there to guide you and show you. And to put it simply, church, when you get saved, there is going to be a spiritual instinct placed inside of you. And you will immediately begin to desire the things that pertain to God. His word, his work, his worship, his church, everything that goes with God. You want to be a lover of God. And this is not going to be a passing thing. That comes here today and go leaves tomorrow. No, if the Holy Spirit is in you, He is there forever. Amen. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is there all the time. And if there is no peace, and if there is no assurance, and if there is no communication between the Holy Spirit and your spirit, then He may not be there. Because the Lord promised when He comes, He is going to be with you. He's going to lead you and guide you and convict you and teach you and show you. And if he's not doing that, if that is not, if you are not experiencing that, maybe he is just not there. And it may be that you need to be saved. Because if the Spirit of God never speaks to your heart, then you need to examine yourself. Now this may be caused sometimes by unconfessed sin in our lives. But while we are walking in the light, the Spirit of the Lord will bear witness within us that we are in the family of God. Now you may be saying, but I don't know whether or not the Spirit is. I tell you, if he's there, you will know. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. If the Spirit of God is in you, you will know. There will be no question about it. There will be times when he will get so big that it becomes crystal clear in your life. And there are other times when he will make his presence known by the subtle little things like an inner desire for prayer. And a desire to go read the word of God. 
or to tell some lost person about Jesus. He will make his presence known and he will give you assurance of your salvation because the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is proof that you belong to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now I know I've covered a lot this morning, but I felt lead, led to, pray, to, to preach this message. Because there are people in the church who are not sure where they stand with God. They may not openly admit it, but it is true nonetheless. And there are others who may have, having heard the word of God, realize that based on the content of this message, they are not sure if they are saved. And if you lack even one of these birthmarks of the true believer this morning, then this message was sent your way for your benefit. Amen. Hallelujah. And if there is a slightest bit of doubt in your mind, then you need to leave that seat where you are and you need to come to the Lord this morning and fix it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Fix it now and forever. And if the Lord is speaking to your heart, you need to come. If you are in doubt, you need to come. If you are convinced that you are lost, you need to come. And even if you are sure you are saved, this might be the best time to come and recommit your life to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us not let pride or the enemy keep us from what God wants to do in our hearts this morning. He, God doesn't want you to continue to live in, 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 in uncertainty and doubt and fear. He can help you if you will come to him this morning. You can know, you can know, you can know without a doubt where you stand with the Lord. And if you have doubt, God can help you fix that today. Because he wants you to know. Praise the Lord. Amen. And the first step in your coming to know for sure is to make your way and come to him. Hallelujah. The scripture says today is the day of salvation. If you have heard the word of the Lord... Harden not your hearts. Amen. I am done. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with us? Oh, praise the Lord. I want, I want to invite you. Oh, hallelujah. I want to invite you to come. You know, none of us, none of us should remain in our seats. None of us should be so proud as to say, I know, I know, I know, I know. There are doubts in all of our minds. So I want you to come. And we're, the ministers are going to come and we are going to pray. We're going to pray that every doubt is going to be removed. Every doubt, every inkling of doubt is going to be removed from every child of God. Hallelujah. Oh. Praise the Lord. Oh, we give you praise. Go ahead, Bob.